Perfect. We're on. All right. Welcome to OPN. OPN, the Open People Network, where we're looking for ninjas all the time in different verticals, where we can all come together, share some great stories, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to help somebody else in their entrepreneurial uh, world and see where we can go. So to start things off, today we're talking about the state of financing in Canada. Panelists that are going to be joining and sharing some uh, of their experiences and knowledge. And if there are uh, a couple other panelists may join in between as we go. But for now, um, we have Malcolm and Brian introduce themselves. Um, I think the first, uh, the first part to what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to give you a little intro about myself. You guys, uh, just give a little intro on yourselves, your background, and kind of uh, where you are now. And there's going to be one question I'm going to ask, and that question is going to be something about yourself that nobody would know. Seconds to kind of think about that, to break the ice, um, and then we'll go from there. So, my name is Jeffrey Pavin, and uh, I'm the CEO of a software company called Hardboot Communications. And at Hardboot, we build custom software applications for startup and enterprise business which kind of works across all verticals. And we decided to create a project about eight months, eight weeks ago, sorry, called OPN. And we wanted to do something where we could give back and OPN was really that way of doing that. So we felt, well, we could build some panels around some great people and push that content out that hopefully will help other learners. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, something about myself that nobody would know. Uh, I'm an avid runner and uh, it's the only thing that's coming to my head, but I love running. It's probably one of my most favorite things I do. I don't know if it's like, um, what's that movie where uh, Forrest Gump, where he just <laughs> runs like crazy? Forrest Gump, buddy. Yeah, I got to have a little bit of that where if there's ever anything that's crossing my mind or I have to go through some, I go for a run. It is, just go for a run. So uh, I'm going to turn it over. Malcolm, you're up. Okay. Uh, I'm Malcolm McTaggart. I run an angel uh, group here in, in the Durham area. Uh, and I teach at UIT uh, and York and, and at Trent. And amongst the subjects I teach are entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial finance. So I bring both a practical and an academic background to it in terms of the various models and approaches and sort of the state of the nation financing wise, at least in Canada. Um, and in the, the angel group that uh, got started three and a half years ago, uh, it's very much like the non-fiction dragon's den or the non-fiction shark tank, depending upon where you're, where you're coming from. And we usually look at um, two or three presentations. Um, we like to identify high potential entrepreneurs with uh, innovative ideas and give them both startup and growth uh, capital where and when they need it. Um, something that nobody knows about me. Uh, I spent my mid teen years in the West Indies and in Trinidad and sailed from there up through the islands. That's awesome. I caught a little bit because I'm bouncing kind of all over, but I think that uh, that was pretty cool. So Brian, you're up, so I'll let you jump into that, and I'm going to uh, transition here for one second. Yeah, so I'm just going to say, in terms of your camera, camera angle, Jeffrey, you need to move a little bit to the right because what I'm seeing right now is if yo dree. There you go. That's what this show is about. If you can dream it, if you can, if you can dream it, we can do it. Your camera's off. No, nope, sorry. My mistake. You see me? Yep. Good. And good positioning now. We can see that tagline. So my background, um, Jeffrey and myself have known each other for, God, 15 years maybe now? And um, um, uh, bought, started, bought, sold companies. Um, started with a technology integration company in 1993. 
Um, I started doing significant work in a specific vertical, which was travel. Uh, got involved with two other partners and turned it into iTravel 2000. Uh, and then ultimately built that company to a quarter billion dollars and sold that company to a UK public company and went through that management transition, which is always different um, and contributing and earning out and all of the different things that go along with m and and then moved on thereafter in 2008 to uh, just broad based uh, senior level business consultancy as an individual uh, and then coincidentally not that we never lost track of each other but uh, stumbled across Jeffrey again and, and we're working together again to build out what is hard boot and what it can do. Very cool. All right. Sorry, guys. I'm, uh, we're just trying to see if we can get uh, uh, Chris in as well. So he's just working on the background to uh, to be added in. So kind of the first question I want to kind of get out there, and I'll ask this, and maybe, maybe the best way to start it is, Malcolm, when you look at the way financing has changed in the last 10 years, where do you kind of feel – yourself part of the angel group is going with investment and where do you how do you see that really working with startups and even it's going to be pre and post uh, revenues where have you seen that change and is Canada becoming a player in the market for financing I think it is. There's been a lot of change over the last 10 years and you know Canada is recognized from a, just from an entrepreneurship standpoint you know, perspective in general. It's amongst the most favorable places in the world to get something going. And the financing area, I think, has evolved um, a lot in the sense that, you know, Angel Group and Angel Financing has become much more organized. Many years ago, it was just down to single you know, individuals uh, who would sort of almost on a whim, it was very casual, very informal. Uh, respond to investment opportunities and, and that was okay but uh, it didn't really give the bread to uh, the, the the companies that are out there in general it was sort of if you didn't know somebody you were really kind of pooched and and now with the establishment of, of organized angel groups um, across the country and the ability to attract more uh, people into those groups gives the benefit of not only adding additional wallet capacity, but there's also the whole uh, issue and the important issue of subject matter expertise. So it's important that from an investor's perspective that when people are coming into the room, that there are people in the group who have a better understanding as to what it is they're talking about. And, and that allows us to make sure that we're financing the right things and, and not those that aren't. Um, so I think that another, I guess, shift has been over the last couple of years that rather than angel groups operating sort of independently, there's much more of a move towards uh, syndicating uh, financing opportunities. So it, typically we would uh, play with it perhaps one to three other angel groups uh, because on a, on a one-off when somebody's coming in to see us for the first time, I mean, our sweet spot is 50 to 250 on that initial round. So uh, when people come back for, for more, uh, we'll happily go in there if it makes sense. And if they're looking for bigger amounts, Jeffrey, as you know, we had one last uh, Thursday uh, in which they were looking for uh, 1.2 uh, million. And so that being done uh, with, with a bunch of other groups. And, and I think that's a trend that's going to continue as we go forward. Well, I think the point to what you're saying there, Malcolm, is that, you know, the angels and even the seed rounds and even early um, Series A kind of fits a, a funding model that is much more outside of the wheelhouse of traditional VC in a lot of cases in Canada. Um, a lot of institutional likes to stick to $5 million plus. 
And it's what we're describing here, I hope, uh, for everybody's benefit, what the landscape looks like between sub five. Yeah. And and to your point, I, I think I, I I follow exactly what you're saying, and and anybody that watches this this content should really realize that, you know, you're in a, a gap here where you might need two, but there is a path to saying these are my milestones to two, and your follow on, I, I'm going to raise two. That's my that's my ask and have people participate at a lower level that are established against uh, milestones much as you were talking about you know if they need follow-on we'll look at that too right it's about putting a, a larger deal together so they get lift out of the raise but yet take down the money early on that they need to operate and then carry on with a forward commitment out of investors whether they're angel or seed or series A for their milestone drip, right? Yeah, I think, well, well that's exactly right. And you talked about this gap. Um, and, and, you know, I was just telling some of my students in today's lecture, I mean, everybody needs to understand that the mega business of today was the two guys in a garage type of business way back when, you know, by and large that things start off very, very small. And, and if they have legs and if there's traction and if the marketplace is interested in what that offering is, then you run into this sort of this chasm issue of once you get past love money and whether that be 5,000 or 50,000. And before you get to anywhere near a series A, you've got this, this, this void um, sort of between, as you say, sort of up to 2 million. And, and that's where it's a really important stage for money to come in because once things have been de-risked to the point where, and there's still a lot of risk, and even when you're looking at a Series A place, but sort of between the Series A and beyond love money, that's where angel money fits in. And, and with this whole advent of sort of syndication, it's going to be somewhat disruptive to the traditional VC world for all the right reasons um, because – you know, they have operated, by and large, they're operating with other people's money rather than their own. Angels operate with their own money. Right. And, and angels have been there, done that, people. So they understand things will go wrong and things will need to pivot. And if you're just working for a fund, you don't have either the empathy or the experience or the awareness to, this is what really happens in the trenches. And, and so I think that the critical financing need for virtually all companies is that that space that angel angel financing fits so i have guys i'm just gonna to jump in there um we're gonna do something a little different um chris is not able to jump Thanks to the sideways through. pitch jeffrey I'm moving to the side now um <laughs> so chris is gonna actually jump in through uh audio so i'll let you introduce yourself uh just tell us a little bit about your background and hopefully it still comes across okay and then uh, obviously something that uh, what you're doing now and then now uh, we can oh, and you have to tell one thing about yourself that nobody would know and then we're going to be able to um, right into the mix so hopefully it comes across okay and everybody can hear you but go ahead okay, um, can everyone hear me first of all yeah you guys can hear me everyone hear me yeah reading the yes yeah, you're good to go. Okay. So uh, my name is Chris Dudley. I am the director for Helix, which is Seneca's on-campus entrepreneurship and innovation incubator. Um, running for the last two years with uh, some uh, very strong success uh, out of the gate, um, which has uh, led um, in somewhat to... Um, uh, new investment into the incubator, including um, the recent announcement of uh, a new building being built uh, called SITE, which will be the Center for Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship, which will be uh, completed September of 2018 at our Seneca Newnham campus. Um, Right now, we have about 58 ventures um, in our incubator accelerator. Um, great. There's been no 
no exits uh, yet, uh, but we do have companies worth uh, 3.75 million, which once again isn't bad getting out of the gate. Um, something that people wouldn't know about me. Um, I, I'm a risk taker. Well, that's probably a, an easy guess. I've been an entrepreneur. Um, but I've, I've jumped out of the plane and uh, I love that experience. So that's something not a lot of people know. I like it. That's awesome. Yeah. Big fan of that. I did it 20 years ago and I felt that it was the most exaggerating uh, for the first 30 seconds. Thought it was an amazing adrenaline rush. And then it was a big snuggie for the next uh, 25 minutes as I floated down to the ground. And I was like, oh, my God, this is killing me. So <laughs> next time I would rather free fall a lot, lot further before I have to open the shootout. But uh, it was pretty fun. So um, to jump so to jump right in, one of the things that we were kind of discussing was uh, where, where you've seen in the last 10 years the state of financing and how it's changed um, over the last 10 years, pretty much in the last five years, I think it's changed dramatically. And where you find angels, VCs, pre-seed money, and, and where that big gap has changed. So uh, Malcolm had some uh, some great insights on um, where angels kind of fit in. And there's this gap of the 2 million mark where we kind of have to find um, – some people that want to take more risk and dive right into these businesses and help these startups. And that's kind of where the, the sweet spot is for on the Mel on Malcolm side. And then um, Brian kind of interlaced into a lot of that and, and helped us pull that through. So where are you guys kind of fit and how are you seeing that happening inside of the incubators at Helix and the school? VCs, um, most certainly want to find those north walls, right? And um, because of that, they want to see some traction. They want to see uh, potentially some um, other investment and, and, and sales. And they really want the, those big hitters. But I think what our incubators is how do companies that are just getting, you know, breath into them and, and just starting out, um, find money because it, it, it's much higher risk. Um, they, they can't really get um, yeah, out, of, uh, out of banks and then applying for, for different um, um, grants and, and loans. There's tremendous competition um, for those. So it, it leaves that passionate entrepreneurs that have great ideas struggling um, to, to build that traction, to, to get their MVP um, built and, and start uh, to get some, some sales. Uh, it, it's a really difficult question and, and one that has to be um, dealt with because Canada uh, is, is losing, I believe, that middle ground between the you know, the very big companies and the very, very small companies. And they need um, people to step in and help out in, in investing and moving those, those smaller companies and letting them ramp up instead of seeing them go elsewhere to, to find that, that capital perhaps in the States where people are a little bit more, the culture is a little bit different in investment. I think there's, we do see a, quite a bit of that where a lot of Canadian companies will start to grow, take the, as Malcolm alluded to earlier, I kind of like the term, the love money. Like once they've, they've taken those dollars, um, they look at where's the fastest way that I can move to market. Everybody seems to think that I need to step across the border, that they're more uh, driven to find me money. Um, but I don't know if that's always the case. I think there's... Um, like the VCs have tainted the Canadian market for so long with uh, how they won't step in, you don't have enough money. So there's this pre notion that if you can't figure it out yourself, then there's nobody that's going to be able to help you. And, uh, you know, again, as, as Brian and Malcolm alluded to that over the last few years, I started to see a lot of that change 
And one of the kind of the questions that I wanted to throw out there, and first I'll share a quick uh, story from when I started nine years ago, but um, going to the bank, because back nine years ago, they didn't have uh, startup dollars and things like that. And the bank was, uh, here's your $15,000 credit card. Um, this is how you're going to start your company. And what is this going to do? <laughs> like, I'll pay somebody this week and then I'm going to be done and I'm going to be out of credit and everything. And they were like, well, you need at least two years worth of credit before we can do anything. And I found in my first, I don't even know, first three, four months, I was already eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 in debt, just burning my own seed fund or my own cash. Um, and then had to work my way out of that and then going back to the bank two years later and saying, look, I managed to survive two years on a $15,000 credit card, up this up a little bit. And then they went through the finances and I think they came back and said, yeah, we're going to give you 50000 And I'm not sure that I ever felt that anybody was supporting that initiative all the way through. But I think now I've seen so many different companies take a little bit of a um, a different leap forward. And I think it really has to do with these angel groups that have started. Uh, they're giving a lot more light into the market. People thinking that they all have to go to VCs and they're just wasting their time. So one of the things that I would like to inquire more on is, is the change occurred because angels have come into the market? Has it, it the entrepreneurs are actually smarter and they understand more of what they're doing? I kind of found that 10 years ago, there the knowledge base of an entrepreneur was quite weak and, and big business wouldn't accept them. But I think now I find that there's a lot more knowledge on where to find money, how to find money, the things you need to go through. Um, there's more metrics. There's a lot more things that entrepreneurs are more familiar with. So is that education level finally caught up? So it's starting to take away from the stigma that you don't, the VCs, if you can't get in front of a VC, you might as well walk away and fold your company. So is the knowledge base a bigger thing? And, and maybe, Malcolm, you can jump on that. Well, well let, me, let me step in for a second because I've seen it evolve for a bit, and then I'll hand it over to Chris and, and Malcolm for sure because they're closer to the sharp end of the stick than I am. But um, I would agree with Chris's earlier comments that the angel funds or the available funds through angels – are much more significant than they used to be in the past. It used to be harder to dig out, less organized, um, harder to find and harder to convince. And much to what Malcolm was saying, you know, there is this gap uh, between half a million and the love money and the real money, right? That takes you from uh, development and prospect to go to market. So. I'm going to leave that at that. I, I've seen that evolve in my own career for 20 years. And I think it's becoming uh, much more an, an easy reality for people to have access to those networks and those people than has ever existed in Canada before. And I'm a guy that's knocked on doors for 20 years around investments in a number of different companies in terms of um, growth capital, seed capital, or even – uh, co oping my own investment in companies. So you guys are really close to the the sharp end of the stick, so I'll leave it to you. But that's my my view. It's it's become a lot more closer and a lot more easier to get to, although we need to discuss what the story needs to be to convince an angel. Well I think there's a, a couple of sort of catalysts to making this happen. And and one is just technology. I mean there's just so much more that you can just search online. And, and so you're able to, if you are an entrepreneur, you know, sort of just Google, uh, where do I get money? Uh, and, and so that, uh, those sources of information just weren't, you know, there certainly, well, maybe not 10 years ago, but 15 years ago. So, so I think that's one element. Another would be the fact that entrepreneurship as a discipline, if you like, has has you know sort of come more to the fore i mean at uit we're offering a major and a minor in entrepreneurship and and there's all sorts of you know schools throughout north america that have recognized that entrepreneurship is important uh you know from an economic perspective and in the same way that 100 years ago people used to believe that 
you know, managers were, were born, couldn't be taught, um, and, and business schools over the last, oh, let's say, decades have proven that that's not the case. There was very much a feeling, go back 25 or 30 years, that, you know, entrepreneurs were born and you couldn't make them, and, and that's equally uh, not, not true. So I think that just the educational awareness, both from an academic perspective uh, combined with, with technology, means that there is just that much more information out there for people seeking money. I think another thing that sort of contributes to that is that the landscape, the corporate landscape, is just fundamentally shift, shifted and changed. I mean, those monolithic days of, you know, sort of people leaving school, going to work somewhere for 40 years and then retiring. I mean, that... That whole model is like Humpty Dumpty. It's been pushed off the wall and it's shattered and it's never coming back. And, and I so it, I don't think it's worked for 40 years, really. But Well, yeah. Um, you know, so there's a number of threads here. Another one would be, you know, this continual downsizing of corporations and, and sort of order to cut costs. I mean, throws a lot of people into becoming entrepreneurs out of necessity rather than by choice. And on the, on the angel side itself, um, I think there's a recognition that, you know, you talk to any portfolio manager and, and they'll tell you that, you know, a portion of somebody's portfolio, just from a modern portfolio theory perspective, you know, is it 5%, 3%, 7% of one's assets should be allocated into alternative investments. And, and those could be any number of things, but one of which would be, early stage, uh, you know, angel investing. Because everybody talks about, oh, I wish I was in on the ground stores of ground floor of Google or Apple or Microsoft. Um, and, and the reality is that that can only come to be if as entrepreneurs or as, as uh, investors, you know, are willing to say, all right, well, if you want to make that happen, first of all, you should assume it's never going to, having said that. If you don't play as, a, as an angel investor at an earlier stage, it's never going to. So uh, I think all of these elements come together and, it, and it's just just changed the whole landscape. So to everyone's benefit. Well, I, I think I, I completely agree with that entire timeline around what's happened, Malcolm. I think um, the one thing that I think people get confused around is that um, everybody can be that angel investor that is – on the ground floor for a Facebook. And I think that's part of what the OSC and other bodies are trying to control in terms of investment, obviously, to make sure that they're controlled risk assessments. Brian, and you're, you're cutting out. out. You're cutting out like crazy right now, Brian. So maybe, uh, Chris, you can jump in, Brian. I don't know if. Uh... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Um, from, from my standpoint, the the culture has has changed uh, or is starting to change somewhat. Um, so at, now we're starting to see uh, entrepreneurship as a noble career. Um, as pointed out, um, there's more education. Um, uh, you have MBAs that have um, entrepreneurship um, sides to them. They, there's degrees and diplomas that most certainly focus mm -hmm. on entrepreneurship, um, you're starting to see incubators and accelerators um, supported within the post-secondary all across the province of Ontario and indeed all across Canada. Um, and I'd even go to uh, TV shows like The Dragon's Den where people are seeing ideas and, and um, how, how they can perhaps bring forward an idea and where they can go to get the tools to actually develop that idea, to get it to a point where you have an angel investor seeing what they need to see, jump in and help them move forward. There's a, um, indeed a entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem that is, uh, is really getting quite rich in Ontario. Um, plug into it here at, uh, at Helix uh, at Seneca and it, it, it's all about educating and bringing the, the uh, entrepreneurs to a point where they can actually go in and talk to angel investors in a, uh, a meaningful way with investors need to see and the traction that needs to be there so that 
the, the investment can happen. And I think that's, that's changing. Well, for sure, the landscape is certainly. And I, I think that with the four buckets that um, everybody seems to have touched on from the enhancements in technology to education and, and I think um, which that falls into uh, is the entrepreneur being a lot more mature. Uh, the landscape has shifted, businesses downsizing, so I agree with all of those. And I think that as the entrepreneur has changed, 10 years ago that entrepreneur, it may have been something that everybody was against, that entrepreneurs can't go anywhere, it costs too much money, the risk is ridiculous, go get a job and work that job. Um, at least that's kind of what I went through when I first started. And I felt that in the last five years, there's been a lot of change just in the attitude as well of these entrepreneurs on how they can go out and get something done. I'm from, as you alluded to, Chris, seeing these TV shows where it's, it's broken down that, hey, you know what, I can do that. I can get in front of somebody and talk about a product that I, that I have the idea I have or the, the cool thing that I want to build. So it's, it's shifted so much that it's almost taken away the fear. I'm, over the years, there was just a ton of fear about stepping out on your own that it was so hard to do. Um, and now you can build a product for $50,000. Ten years ago, that product cost you <clears> 1000 or 200000 So it was such a change just in the way technology is enhanced and allowed for somebody to get to an MVP, whereas prior they weren't able to do that. So there has been quite a bit of a shift in that I guess what that kind of shifts next to or the next question that I would um, would ask is that do you find that the government changed their outlook on it and I from the time of the last recession not from the bubble burst in 2001 I'm not sure that they got the learning enough from there to shift everybody into being entrepreneurs but I do think that since the last housing crisis in 2007 that's kind of changed the way businesses operate and the where entrepreneurs have come in. I think there's been a bigger change in that aspect. And do you find that the government's changed enough to support this so that you guys as or um, selling a company like in Brian's case or, or being an angel in, in uh, Malcolm's case, do you find that the government's changed a lot of policies and tried to help move forward by, to, you know, making you feel comfortable that being a, an entrepreneur is a good thing and, and here's where you can find money and here's some places like Mars that are going to help you out. Chris? Yeah, um, most certainly the all levels of government have um, started to understand that entrepreneurship, um, they need to support it in a real um, and we start to see like the the uh, the feds have come out with their the two billion um, going to post secondary and a lot of that has started found their way into innovation and entrepreneurship uh, areas across the country, um, including Seneca, with as I mentioned earlier, the new site building. The, the money came into that and supporting that. The province, um, through the, the One Network, uh, OCE, um, Ontario Centers of Excellence, has started to um, support incubators um, in post-secondary institutions all across the province, uh, universities and colleges, um, with uh, some funding, but also um, some other like smart start um, funds or global start funds so that... Um, um, companies, uh, youth entrepreneurs coming through uh, incubators and accelerators like Helix can start seeing different funds to help them forward until they, they have enough traction um, that um, angel investors see them and then uh, some more traction with VCs coming in. Um, but also right down to... Um, Auto and, and York Region, the city market, they all actually contribute in one way, shape, or form into Helix as well because they see the, the, the benefits. So people are now coming to, to the table um, in all levels of government with not only um, cash, which truly signals that they are in this game, but also other support that... Um, uh, made available through them, which I think is, once again, I keep coming back to starting to change the culture around uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm quite excited about that future. Um, I, I think if we have this conversation in five or six years, we will we would be able to point to a couple of things that have happened, which has 
upon you know tens and twenties and thirties and forties of uh, really strong companies, but hundreds and thousands of companies that are are, are just you know uh, bottom shops that are are running and starting to grow and really contributing positively to the economy that weren't there before. And I think that key is that that you're positively the business is growing. As <clears throat> the business is small, I think there's be a kind of a bad thing that people think that they have to start a business and it's got to be ten people and it's got to drive revenue. It's got to do this, but really no, at the end of the day, it doesn't. It just has to be something that's a small idea that can foster and grow from one person and build revenue and be positive in the, the local environment and help grow from whatever that idea might be. They, that they need to be you know, successful, obviously, sustainable and scalable, right? Those are what you're looking for. Um, you don't want one and dones. You don't want um, something that's great for a year or two and then for, you, you want something that it, it hurts Potentially small, but it's it, it can scale and it's sustainable and it will be around. To, in respect, in respect, I think that's what that's what's missing from government funding programs, whether it's IRAP, whether it's the credits you have available in Shred, whether what you can claim for under different granting programs for startups, and I think it's more consistent with what Malcolm's saying um, as it relates to angels. There is less scrutiny around the validity and the possibility of business success out of government granting and the other incentives that are already out there and have been, frankly, out there for decades. Um, so we have we have an increasing infrastructure which, which is really positive around a bunch of um, forward thinking politicians that are behind very valid business funding and granting programs. And I think the scrutiny is what is at issue. It's a scrutiny that comes out of government that is obviously, at least in my experience, a lot less diligent than it's my $10 in my pocket, which is a little bit more close to Malcolm's uh, wheelhouse around I've got five guys that have, you know, I, I'm an accredited investor. I've got north of five million net equity. So it, it's about how we how we distribute and and adjudicate the allocation of funds. There is no lack of of ideas. I, I will grant you that for sure. Jeffrey and I come with uh, with ideas every day. Well, but I think one of the things. Sorry. I was just going to say, I think no, one of the things that's true is the fact that, you know, government is well-intentioned and there has been a lot of um, recognition within various government levels uh, on the importance of entrepreneurship for a variety of different reasons. And, and they have and are struggling uh, to, to do their best. I think one of the challenges there, though, is that, you know, I think, and this is to your point, Brian, that... The, the level of scrutiny or diligence that gets applied when you're writing a check with your own money versus when you're uh, working in a, a government department. I mean, there's, there's a huge uh, order of magnitude difference there. And it's not because the person who's working in the government department isn't trying. It's just that if you're not in those circumstances, it's very difficult. I mean, it, it appears very yeah, academic in terms of... I get of, it, because I've written my own checks, and, and as you have yeah. as well. So I completely get what you're saying. Please carry on. So, I, But I think that there are some things, um, and there are other countries that do it uh, better, but nonetheless, the, for example, the, the FedDev IBI program, the Investing Business Initiative, in which it will invest up to 50% of the money that angels, um, or let's call it angels, there may be other sources as well. But if the angels put a check in for say a half a million dollars, that through the IBI program, that, that company would be eligible for uh, up to 250,000. And, and that's a pretty quick process relatively in that 
the government's sort of, I think, strategy on that is to say, well, if a bunch of private individuals have decided that they're going to write checks for half a million dollars, we'll take that as being sort of good enough diligence and that we as a government don't have to do much more than just support it's the sort of the, the fact that these individuals, these private individuals have, have satisfied themselves that this is worthy enough. And so therefore we'll just piggyback on top of that. Uh, and, and I think that that's a very positive way that governments can play a role without tying it down in bureaucracy and without making it inefficient and without requiring people that don't have the skill sets or the experience within government departments. And again, it's not their fault. It's just their their experiences are different. And, and I, I would like to see more of that where the governments just say, okay, a bunch of private money people are putting in money and we'll take that as being good enough and we'll write a check for 50%. And you could cut out a lot of inefficiency and a lot of waste and get more money into the hands of those companies that you know, have a genuine opportunity to, to succeed and grow. For sure, but I think that that might actually, I think for maybe there's a segment of dollars that that works for. Because I remember when they were trying to build, um, I think it was in Richmond Hill, trying to build a stadium. I think it was for, uh, was it football, if I remember correctly? And they were trying to build it the same same way, same idea, was that all of these people were going to invest money in. So in order to go back to the government and say, hey, this is going to do a great job. Why don't you guys put in half the stake as well? Um, and this could go for really anything. It, does that start to drive people to start building things in their own initiative, get people to put into it so that the government's offsetting those costs, which just means taxpayers are putting their money into that because they're lacking scrutiny. Um, regardless of knowledge or not, it, does that become uh, an issue to putting their money into the wrong businesses? Well, I get where you're going with that because it sounds like we're going to take um, as a judgment level on diligence, the initiative of, private individuals that can place money in any company that they want uh, based on OSC rules, obviously, but nonetheless um, place money and based on that placement have government dollar match either whether it's 100% or 50% doesn't really matter. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's an abrogation of government's responsibility on the proper and responsible and fiduciary placement of that, that amount of money. So there's a danger there, of course, and this is just hanging off of what Jeffrey said, but I, I can see it, we're kind of digressing off of the conversation, I think, because I don't think any of the people that we're trying to speak to today is about uh, scamming. It's about where do I find my next $250,000 or $500,000, not uh, how do I capitalize on the weaknesses or the, the poke holes in government funding. But you're right, and I think a lot of it comes back to that is that we're still trying to – it's almost like an, um, the internet 20 years ago when it first started up. I think that entrepreneurs, financing, and everything else kind of fits in that bucket is that um, there's a lot of people that have a lot of great experience, and there's a lot of people that are still kind of new to it. So the space is still kind of just trying to get its legs. I said starting this – your setup three years ago um, – it could have been something that started 10 years ago, but it really probably wasn't as uh, looked at and as positive in the light of entrepreneurs until probably the recent five years, which has now escalated what you're doing um, to be the forefront and the runners of any startup that's going to happen in the GTA um, and Durham region and, and outskirts of it, where it actually is making an impact and making a huge change and difference in the way startups are actually being funded and being driven out. Um, I'm sure that since you've started, you've probably gone through hundreds, if not almost thousands of businesses that you've seen start up just in that amount of time. But you took three years earlier than that, there probably wouldn't even been a quarter of those. So I think that because there's so much more legs to get the financing and get all of these things that um, catch up and so is everybody else. And the learning is still a bit behind in that. Well, I think to Brian's point that uh, we don't want to get off topic and make this a government policy conversation. But uh, one of the things that has that also changed the landscape from a financing perspective is sort of 
post the dot com bubble number one uh, but more recently post oh seven oh eight when a lot of uh, people uh, that that uh, sort of met the criteria for being uh, angel investors I mean they lost a lot of money on their quote unquote safe investments and you know so when you, you sort of turn that around and kind of go well what if I took some of my money and got involved on a more personal basis, I'd have perhaps uh, more involvement, more control. And if I'm doing it with others, I'd have better insight as to what, you know, um, hard boot is doing than I would be able to see through sort of the opaque veil of what's happening at BNS. And, and so I, I think that that's another, I mean, I know of one, uh, one angel specifically, I mean, he started off probably about, uh, maybe 10 years ago um, and people thought he was crazy. His wife thought he was crazy. His broker thought he was crazy because he was going to put money into this, you know, crazy uh, idea that was just a startup. Um, and, and just to compress the story, I mean, over a course of 10 years, he's now completely out of the public markets um, and just invests in angel side and, and has, you know, got sufficient exits where, you know, he's, he's generating, you know, sort of a north of a 40% internal rate of return on an annual basis. Um, and and he, he feels good about it because he, A, gets to contribute and give back. Uh, B, he's got sufficient number of investments that, you know, rather than just going around the golf course, he can, you know, actually get his teeth into something and he finds it stimulating and interesting. And the whole notion of being able to give back, I mean, for those that have been you know, sort of blessed and fortunate. Uh, it's not to say that it's completely altruistic, but I, I know from our group, it's it's an important component that you want to be able to, and, and as Jeffrey, you've probably heard me say, you know, be the person you needed 25 years ago. And and so that's not just money, it's also, it's also advice uh, and support. So I think there's a, a multitude of, of sort of reasons why this, this whole space has taken off with respect to early stage or um, smaller amounts of, of money available for investment. And it's not always about, um, it's not always about the money. It's the key thing is that you're giving back. So, um, I think that's what kind of drives people, right? I can make connections. I can do a lot more than just give money. Um, obviously it's a component to it. Chris, what's, uh, what was your thoughts on all that? So, well, one of the things that coming back to the government that I, I'm concerned about is that we're shifting priorities the next round of, of funding for these supports that are, are being across Canada will see their funding dry up and it won't, they will not have um, uh, gathered enough steam and had a, um, uh, investment from different companies to keep them going. And you'll see these wonderful education spaces and incubators that have been set up to support start to dry up and will because of shifting priorities of, of the of the government and we've seen this in the past where there's been an influx so this is the you know, very critical importance to Canada and, and it gets a lot of money and then it and all of a sudden we don't have have enough traction to, to keep it going and our future generations pay the price because we don't have those supports so I'm, I'm really worried that um, right now the governments are really um, supporting entrepreneurship and innovation but I, I'm really worried that this is not going to be a long-term strategy and it really truly has to be. I, I think I kind of would agree with that too and, and maybe it's that whole phenomenon where you you uh, um, like in business you outsource and then you insource and then you outsource and every 10 years you kind of shift that strategy around but if it's very new to the government and i know a couple of government agencies that were strong and going very well and then they shut down funding anymore and it would be last wire last minute or we're going to get some money to be able to fund some startups and then they would eventually they just fold it so I think you're right. If it's not something that's always being allocated, if it's a social program or however they set it up, that there's always going to be continuous funding to grow um, entrepreneurs in Canada, then you're right. It could get something where they start chopping it out first because it's the easiest dollars to go after. 
going to have other problems that we've run into in the past with uh, funding places like um, Mars and places like that where they went through some turmoil for a while and are starting to get their legs again. But um, you're right, it, there has to be something that's a little bit more steady because if they pull out, then it's going to be stuck on the entrepreneurs to support entrepreneurs, uh, which isn't a bad thing. But Yeah, I want to touch on something that Brian mentioned earlier, and that goes back to the role of government. I mean, uh, and, and in Canada, I mean, what I would not want to see is that, that government does more than it should do. I mean, these programs will stay in place as long as ultimately the electorate supports it and as long as they're shown to drive results. They don't have a reason to exist just because they existed. I mean, just because there's an infrastructure there and just because there's a support there doesn't mean it should be a God-given right or would be a God-given right. So I think that it's, it's important that we don't lose sight of the ball. The whole purpose here, from my perspective, is not to set up some massive bureaucratic infrastructure with hundreds or thousands of incubators. I just think that's a complete waste of taxpayers' money. What I'd rather see is there's some more focused way to identify and support uh, those entities. And when I talk about entities, I'm not talking about you know, incubators. I'm talking about companies that, that you know, are looking to get the investment. And, and there's the sort of the one area of concern I have is that the, the seesaw gets tilted towards bureaucratic infrastructure of support organizations and mechanisms. I mean, if you think in Ontario alone, you've got the SBEC, SBECs, you've got RICs, you've got OCE, you've got various uh, incubators in, in schools. And I, from my perspective, we're right on the cusp of that's enough. You know, and, and there can always be more money spent on more government programs and, and more people running those government programs and administering those programs, and it becomes an industry unto itself. And that's not the purpose. The whole purpose is designed, in my opinion, is to be able to get funds in to fill that void, as we were talking about earlier, between that sort of 50 and 2 million, those companies that are beyond the love money and can't get the Series A, that's where the need is. It's not to develop some sort of bureaucratic you know, infrastructure that becomes a, a beast unto itself that's got to be fed. I just you know, sort of completely disagree with the notion that, well, they always have to be there forever. If they deserve to be there, then the governments will support it, and if they don't, they shouldn't. Well, I, I don't, and please correct me if, or um, I want to correct myself. I'm not saying that um, a, a government that is going to constantly just shell out tons of money without any oversight and, and, and keep funding a well. What I'm suggesting is that we need to have a long-term vision, a plan, a strategic plan around this, which doesn't mean that every school gets an incubator or that every um, a government agency around uh, innovation or entrepreneurship is seeded with lots of funds. What I'm I'm suggesting is strategic plan so that um, uh, strong players know what the plan is and how they're going to transition through that plan and what their signposts are to continue to grow and if they are contributing um, in a positive way, however we identify that, and they are supporting um, entrepreneurs, and we're seeing companies launched from from that those incubators and those spaces that are truly contributing to the Canadian economy, then that's something that we want to continue to support. You're always wondering, you know, from year to year, is, is, is this is the funding just going to continue to be cut? And am I scrambling around trying to find the next um, dollar to keep this place open? Or am I actually focusing in on helping people own businesses? Uh, I guess that's what I'm saying is a government long-term strategy around, and that is smart, that um, um, the Canadian people can rely on. No, for sure. Brian, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that the so far the way the government structured things that we're heading in a direction where there's going to be support for, oh, we may have just lost Brian. Um, Jeff, I'll be back in a minute. For sure. 
Chris, what you're saying is that even with that long-term strategy, that there still has to be some scrutiny put in behind it, because if there isn't, then uh, it'll just kind of wean itself off, and eventually you're going to find it that government stops to, you know, not really supporting it, not really getting behind it, because they haven't put a vision behind how they're going to support all of these startups. And I think, check the statistic, but I can't remember what it was. I think it was something to the fact that... Um, in Canada in the last 10 years that there has been, is it a 30% shift to entrepreneurs as being the, the largest growth in Canada? Yep, somewhere around there. Um, yeah, and I, I totally understand and respect that the government can't be this endless um, faucet of money that you turn on. Um, incubators have to find their own feet. Other support um, agencies have to find their their own, uh, their own um, supports and, and be smart and, and work within the ecosystem. But um, is you're not going to necessarily see all the benefits. Um, it, it's you're investing in, in the future. So it will take a little bit of time to start uh, seeing the the rewards of what is the funding of today is, is uh, impacting on the Canadian economy, um, and I and I don't want to lose sight of of that. And, and that makes sense. So it kind of ties in well with um, kind of how I think in the last few years how angels and VCs have started to see how funding is working and how things are kind of shifting. So I think maybe in a way it's almost dictating to the government how they need to support support this whole growth and entrepreneurship at the same time. They're kind of in a way following to to VCs and angels based on how their investment processes and policies are occurring, that the government's starting to feed that same engine and learn off of them as well. Targets, make sure people hit those targets. um, Yeah, that's important. For, uh, just for kind of um, a next idea or question, where do you see and how do you see people engaging with you guys at Helix? What do you think is the you know top three things or what you would recommend as being for everybody that this is something that Angelus at Helix, these are kind of the requirements, this is the thing that we look for, um, this is how we can help you, or if we can't, we're going to direct you to this government uh, body that can help you. What is the um, how's that track work for you guys? I guess what we're looking for is um, a passion around uh, innovation, um, the the ability to um, um, feedback and take that to heart to to adapt to pivot. Um, that. That's what we're we're looking for in the people who come through. Uh, right now, we we've, we've had over a thousand six hundred um, youth connect in some way, shape, or form to to Helix, and some of them are just grabbing information um, through workshops that we we do with Venture Lab um, or uh, speaker series. Um, just what innovation and entrepreneurship is and and others like i said we have 58 ventures that we're working with um they're they're really um engaging with our our um mentors and they're they're moving uh, we make some great connections they follow up with those connections um and they're they're now starting to employ uh, uh people so i i think to answer your question, what we're looking for is is somebody that um, willing to work with a, a, a team um, um, will accept feedback and has a, a passion around innovation and entrepreneurship as a starting point. Great, Malcolm. Uh, what the question was was that uh, in. In entrepreneurs and businesses that are starting up, what is it that you recommend? Um, that these entrepreneurs um, are able to in, in the way that they're going to engage with you. So uh, is it the things, the top three things that they're going to need 
um, in order to get in front of you guys at, at the Angel Network. And if it's something you can't do, then you're going to make a connection to this government body. What is that um, kind of next step and, and how do you um, kind of envision these entrepreneurs coming to talk to you? Requirements, what do you need out of it? And, like, and just to give you some context, what Chris was saying is that, you know, they've had a lot of people over the last couple of years um, come into them from 1,600 students to now uh, working through about, and, and they look for people that are innovative, a lot of passion, new feedback, and being able to kind of move forward in that direction. What are the types of things that get you excited when you have businesses come in and pitch you, and, and how do they get in and pitch you? Well, well, let me answer that second part first. Um, you know, on our on our website, if companies are or individuals are looking for investments, we have our three pages, which you, you saw last week. Um, so anybody can fill that in, and then they just send it in to me, and then I'll do a scan on them, and and if I think that there's something that's got legs there, then uh, you know, I'll get back to them. I always try and get back to people anyway. I'm not 100% good at that, but uh, I always try and at least give them some feedback as to like, it's not of interest to us at this time. And so it's an easy process. I mean, we're very accessible. It's just, it's on the website. In terms of what we look for, um, the first thing that I look for is is really what is the opportunity? And And... I'd rather have a great opportunity than a good idea. And by that, I mean, is the entrepreneur able to identify that there's a niche out there that's not being served? Or if it is being served, that they've got a new, better, more disruptive way or just an improved way of being able to fill that space. Because at the end of the day, for any business to become successful, there has to be not only, there has to be demonstrated market demand. And that comes from inviting strangers to open their wallets and give you money. And, and so we focus on, you know, first and foremost, um, size the opportunity and explain why it's not being addressed now and what it is that you can do. Uh, and, are you, you know, are you saving someone money? Are you making them money? Are you saving them time? Or are you just enhancing their experience um, because you like that video game better than another video game? So certainly all those things in terms about being coachable, um, you know, are important as well. But what we find is that if somebody has really thought through, you know, looking at it through all facets of the gemstone and they're able to articulate, um, you know, what their business is about. And, and one of the things that I always look for is the, is the lean canvas you know, the, the precursor to the business model canvas. It's a startup, just that lean canvas. Because if you can't articulate on one piece of paper what your business is about, you really don't understand it. And I think it was Churchill who said, you know, I'm sorry I sent you this three-page letter because I didn't have time to send you a one-page letter. And, and so anybody can be verbose and write a lot. But to be able to distill it down and succinctly put it all on one piece of paper so that anybody uh, can understand it. That's really the, the art. So that would be opportunity, brevity, succinctness, and coachability. So it kind of fits well in with, uh, with, with what Chris was saying too. So um, Brian, on your side, when we're going through different companies and different businesses and, and kind of giving that overview of make something approachable and make something that's uh, invest. And, and all these good things, what are the things that you look for that as, as well?
for sure. I think, I think to kind of summarize all this, because I know we're, we're getting close to the end, I think that it comes down to being able to articulate a great story, build an idea the, with your idea built around it, being open to um, change and pivoting and being uh, smart about the direction you're going. But I think at the end of the day, the big component that drives the most of it is the passion that you have behind it. Everything else kind of lines up to that. And I kind of have a feeling that uh, most of the time in seed round and, and angel style investing, are building into that entrepreneur. They're really looking at that person and saying, yeah, you know what, I can stand behind this person um, and help them move forward. The business. Which and, and that's if I may, that's the difference of, of each of us. Um, we we will see the entrepreneur at different. I, in my particular area, we are coming and, and seeing people with uh, an idea, um, very raw. They don't know what to do. They don't have any data behind it. They haven't done any real customer validation. Um, they business model canvas, there's nothing there. And part of our job is to get them to a, a point where they can now go and see Malcolm and, and, and have everything that he needs to move forward um, from his area. So we're seeing, even though there's certain elements that um, people want to see, regardless of each of us, we want to see the same things, passion, um, ability to take input and, and such. We also are looking for for different things um, at, at different stages. Well, just uh, I, I think by and large I agree with you, Brian. But you know, one thing—at least I can't speak for other angel groups—but um, we don't put a lot of emphasis on people who have been there, done that before. I mean, I, I can think there's probably at least, if I had to pick a number, I'd say a third of the presentations that that we see uh, that I want to put in front of the group where it's really, a, I look at it, we're betting on the jockey more than the horse. Well, it's not a perfect world. No, I understand. 
Well, I mean, I'd, I'd turn it around a bit in terms of, you know, and if there isn't a mechanism by which, let's say in my case, I said a third, um, and I don't know off the top of my head what proportion would get funded. But it, at some point in time, nobody gets that first job that has previously had experience. So, I mean, at some point in time, somebody takes that leap of faith and says, okay, I believe in Brian, and we're just going to go with it. That's true. And, yeah. and everything's going to go that way, right? It's, uh, you know, everybody can say, well, it's because my idea wasn't good enough, so they shut it down. It could be, oh, I didn't have this. There's always going to be the if and the buts and everything. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it's the entrepreneur that's analyzing what they know and what they have. And you know what? You're going to hit... 10 angel groups, you're going to hit 20 other groups and eventually someone's going to find an interest in you and in your product and you're going to get that opportunity and you're going to have to make sure that you blow it out, out of the water and maybe that does mean that you have to have some experience pitching other people and maybe that might be getting in front of Helix first but you're going to figure that out as an entrepreneur what's going to get you in front of those people and I think that a lot of these different components that are going to do that, I think there's a whole new discussion on what really makes up that pitch that's going to interest VC or an angel or um, a government project or, or a Helix program that's actually going to get you in the door. And I've watched uh, some different panels over the past um, couple months and some people were like, if you email the hell out of me, I'm not going to talk to you. Um, if you do this, you do this. Like everybody has their own little criteria on how, how to be attracted to that person. And just like the rest of us, we're attracted to people that are similar to us. So you're almost looking for a group that fits you. And I think one of the contexts that I got out of I was in is that, you know, you got to find people that understand the product that you're trying to do, understand the space a little bit more. They're going to have more context to be able to review that and say, yeah, you know what? I did see a business like this two years ago. We invested in it. It went well. This is somewhat a, of a spin off of that enhancement of it, whatever you may say it is. And you know what? I'm going to get them in here because this space fits with us. Pull in every single entrepreneur and every single pitch that gets in front of them and try to have them get in front of the group because nobody has that much time. So focus on the ones that the businesses that uh, or the, um, uh, the groups that can fund you. Focus on the ones that have a space that's similar to it or they're in finance and find ones that do investment in finance because that's going to get you a little bit faster uh, and more interest quicker. So, um, but I think at that, I, 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 like I said, I'd love to keep going because there's probably a ton more we can talk about. Um, but maybe at that point, I'm going to ask one last question. It won't be the last question I asked on the last panel because I think that will drive a, a longer conversation. So it'll just be kind of a, a quick snapshot series. Malcolm. <laughs> The Jays. The Blue Jays are still in the run. They can still make it. Any thoughts? I, I said the Blue Jays. Okay, I love it. Brian? Brian? Can you hear? I don't know if you can hear me or not, but... Oh, you're on mute. Chris, listen, I'm I'm a homer. Um, so Jay is uh, taking on the Cubbies. Um, go to seven, but uh, the Blue Jays squeak it out. Series again, I love it. Brian, you're on mute, so you have to unmute. Well, I can't unmute you, man. So we can't hear you. I asked earlier, so I was trying to kind of say, do I want to throw that one out there because um, there might be some heated conversation from it, but uh, we can throw that one out as well. The last one was for uh, for Hillary, so um, I'll let you throw out who you're, uh, who you're thinking is going to win. Well, I, I think they're both going to different uh, target markets. Um, 
so uh, I, I think we're going to see a dichotomy in the way people, uh, the way the two of them answer questions, and they won't care because they're speaking to their to their people. Um, I think a lot will be made after it, but it will be two radically different styles speaking in two different um, ways to two different target markets. You're basically it's one or the other, and I'm not sure either one is going to work very well in the in the first place. But uh, Malcolm, what are your thoughts? Jose Bautista. <laughs> I like it. Jose Bautista for president. I'm in. Well, I don't know. We're having some technical difficulties. Brian's on mute, and I can't get him off mute. So uh, I think we're going to be stuck on that one. He's going to have to uh, email out his uh, his results. But the debate will be pretty interesting tonight regardless. So um, I would scratch my vote personally, but I live there. So I'm going to – I think that it's Danger Bay all over. But so – all right, guys. Well, all right, you got two seconds. You can answer the question. Two seconds. We got to go. So, For sure. Okay, so now you gotta answer those questions and we gotta go. So you're saying the Blue Jays? Oh, all right, well, if you have no guys, then, then uh, we're at a, a fine end now. So I'm gonna wrap it up. And uh, thank everybody. Malcolm had a jump, so he's already gone. Chris, thank you very much for all your time. Brian, thank you as well. Thank you for hanging in on my technical difficulties. I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate being part of this panel. Thank no, for sure. Much. No, thanks a lot. So we'll uh, we'll regroup and uh, we'll send something out over the next couple of weeks. So we'll uh, send the broadcast and everything out. So, but thank you very much. Great night. You too. Cheers. All right. Cheers.